So what she sees is a vision in the drowsy gloom in the sleepy darkness, the dull of midnight. At her couch's foot, the end of her couch. Couch kind of means bed in this case, I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> not like a sofa. Lorenzo stands at the foot of her bed and cries. The forest tomb has ruined his glossy hair, which once could shoot luster into the sun. It was shot beams of light back at the sun because it was that shiny. Put cold doom upon his lips and taken the beautiful music out of his lonely voice. Past his loamed ears, um, had made a miry channel for his tears. So because he's been lying on his back and he's kind of covered in mud, um, his ears are really dirty, but there's like a channel uh, where his tears have been flowing that create kind of a a passage through the mud on his face. It's supposed to be kind of over the top and funny at parts. Like he, he deliberately, I think, has a sense of humor with this poem. I find bits of it so extreme that they go beyond tragic into comic and um a lot of great tragedians that write tragic narratives actually uh kind of infuse their tragedy with elements of comedy to make it more light at certain parts so that it's kind of in it sort of intensifies the drama of it so Shakespeare does that a lot he has tragicomic elements in his stories and I think Keats as an admirer of Shakespeare just copies that a lot so in this case, it's so over the top how this ghost looks with like channels for his tears on his muddy face. Loamed ears in particular is a, a very humorous image of someone having muddy ears. Um, yeah, so he's kind of gothic and dark and frightening in some ways, but also a bit silly and a bit over the top in other ways. So he looks kind of like a ghost or a zombie or something like that. He's um, appearing, but as a vision. It's not clear if he's a, a kind of dream vision or if he's a um, a ghost, like an actual spectre. And it's totally up to you how you interpret that. So it's a strange sound when he speaks because his voice is trying to speak like it used to when it was awake on earth. Um, but Isabella is really interested in what it has to say and she listens to it because it's trem trembling like an old wizard, an old druid trying to play a badly strung harp. So it's kind of music, but it's not pleasant music and it's not earthly music, something spiritual and kind of otherworldly about it. It's quite a nice way to describe the voice of a ghost, I think, personally. I quite like that image. So it moans a ghostly undersong. It, it can't sing properly, but it, it kind of makes this noise that's almost like a song. And it has a rough sound to it. It's hoarse, like a sore throat, kind of like the way that um, thorny br briars, thorn bushes in sepulchres and graveyards sound when the wind gusts among them through the night. So it's a very gothic image. Keats was really interested in um, gothic as a genre and definitely influenced at points by uh, gothic imagery. So this is, these two stanzas that we've looked at are very hyper gothic and you can uh, read more about gothic and what gothic is to help you analyze those in more detail. But yeah, ghost Lorenzo is a lot more goth than uh, living life Lorenzo as you would expect so it's he's still got elements of how he was when he was alive he's wild his eyes are wild and still kind of dewy with love so he still feels love and he's kind of afraid uh, stops the fear of the phantom because of his eyes being so full of love because it's kind of like a magic that hangs over Isabel So normally you'd be afraid of a ghost, but she's not afraid because of something to do with the way it looks at her with love. And it unthreads, it unravels the story of what's happened. The murderous spite of pride and avarice. Avarice is greed. Both of those, pride and avarice, are two of the seven deadly sins as well. So it reinforces the brothers and how um, sinful and evil they are. 
the dark pine roof of the forest, the sodden, wetty, uh, wetty, <laughs> the wet turfed dell of the kind of grassy valley where without any word he was killed. He was killed from stabs. From stabs he fell is not Keats' best line, I don't think. Sometimes you have to remember that Keats is very young and he's writing these and um, if I'd written poetry aged 20 or 21 like this, um, yeah, I would be impressed by how good it is rather than too critical of the bits that are a little bit silly. But every so often you'll find lines in Keats that just feel a bit unfinished or unrefined. It's because he was a very young poet who tragically died too early and so he never reached maturity. Um, so yeah, there's like lots of little imperfections in Keats that you shouldn't get too bothered about. But yeah, occasionally he just writes something that makes me cringe and from stabs he fell. <laughs> just sounds like a kind of like a child. Um, whereas a lot of obviously what he writes is quite complex. So we'll we'll allow it, Keats for now. <laughs> so yeah, he, he died from being stabbed by swords without any explanation or any kind of chance to do anything about it. So he says, my Isabel, my sweet, and he tells where he's lying, where he's dead. She says, you can find it because there's red whirtle berries. These are bilberries, like wild blueberries. I don't know why they're red, but anyway, they droop above his head. And there's a large flint stone on, at his feet and beech and chestnut trees all around. And there's sheep that you can hear across the river where he lies. Go and cry upon the heather where, where I am and it will make me feel better. So he gives her all this kind of um, visual imagery to signify where the tomb is. Yeah, and he says, I'm a shadow now. Alas, I'm sadly a shadow. I live alone on the edge of human nature. I chant the holy mass, so I, um, I uh, chant prayers, while little sounds of life around me make noises. Glossy bees at noon do fieldward pass, like this one, little glossy bees um, in the middle of the day go over my grave towards that field where the sheep are. And I can hear chapel bells, I can hear the bells of churches telling me the hour. It's very sad and those sounds grow strange to me because you are distant in humanity, like you humans are all distant from me and you as a living person, Isabella, are distant from me. I know what happened and I feel fully now what's happening and if spirits could feel anger, I would rage, but I forgot the taste of what it feels like to be on earth. Paleness warms my grave and it's as if I had a seraph, an angel chosen from the bright abyss to be my spouse, to be my wife. Your paleness makes me happy. Your beauty grows upon me and I feel a greater love steal through my whole being. So he's got this kind of tension between not feeling the same way he did while he was alive, but trying to remember for the sake of um, kind of his unfinished business of getting payback on the brothers. So the idea of ghosts and spirits that Keats is drawing on, which is also a Gothic idea is that um, they are alive on earth or that they're kind of around on earth because they have unfinished business. So Lorenzo's unfinished business is revenge on the brothers or um, kind of telling Isabella what really happened to him so that she doesn't think he just abandoned her. So the spirit sadly says adieu and dissolves like this one, atom darkness. So it leaves the complete darkness around him in a slow turmoil. It's kind of a slow, slow swirling darkness where he was. Kind of like when a person who's not sleeping properly at midnight thinks about the difficult hours they have to spend working without reward. And we put our eyes into the pillow and see the gloom swirl and froth up and boil around us. The ghost had made, made sad Isabella's eyelids ache and as soon as the day came, she sat up awake. 
So in terms of quotations, this is kind of useless to you. You can't really analyze it very much, but I just think it's a really beautiful image about how darkness swirls before your eyes. Um, kind of like if you're pressing your eyes into the pillow and you see all these kind of shapes and things swirl by. So it's, it's a really nice uh, poetic concept that I think he wanted to put in there, but it, it doesn't really do anything for the poem. So yeah, don't quote it, but pay attention to how nice it is. I think it's nice anyway. Um, so she said, haha, I didn't know how hard life could be. I thought misery was the worst thing that could happen to me. I thought fate controlled our lives, giving pleasure or stress, deciding if we're happy or dead. But there's a crime involved here, a brother's bloody knife. So this is what we call an anagnorisis, if you're doing tragic narratives. This is a moment of realization that comes too late to change anything. An anagnorisis is a classic tragic trope where the tragic hero has to realize um, what's gone wrong, but they don't realize at a point where they can do anything about it. So she trusted her brothers fully, and that was one of her flaws. She was completely at the whim of her brothers. She never would suspect them of any foul play. And here she's been um, given the truth from Lorenzo himself. So a brother's bloody knife, it's quite um, Macbeth. If you ever studied Macbeth, there's a lot of stuff to do with the B and the plosive alliteration and the imagery of blood and crime, murder in particular. Um, but yeah, there is a crime, a, blood is, a, a brother's a bloody knife is a good line to analyze there. Especially the caesura, the pause in the middle as well, that dash you can analyze. So sweet spirit, you've educated me in my youth, in my uh, childishness, and I'll come and visit you and kiss your eyes and greet you morning and evening in the skies. So by the time it's the next day, she plans to go to the forest and she takes a, a nurse, an old nurse with her. Um, and they basically just plan to find him to find the body of Lorenzo. So they creep along the riverside and Keats hears a sea. Look, they're creeping along the riverside. So he's quite dramatic, his narrative voice, if you want to analyze that. How she, look at how they creep. Look how she whispers to that old woman. And after looking round the champagne wide, champagne in this case means field. It is where the word comes from, the, the word champagne. Um, if you did French, uh, champagne, campagne. It's kind of like an old word, I think. Maybe it was champagne at one point, but basically field. They look around the field wide and she checks that nobody's watching. And then she shows the woman a knife and she says, look. And so the old lady's like, what, what feverish, what sick and chaotic fire burns in you? What good can happen to you to make you smile again? And they find Lorenzo's grave by the evening from the way that he describes how to find it. Um, so this is another one of my favorite useless stanzas that I find really, this is probably the most humorous stanza that Keats ever wrote as far as I'm concerned. Who hath not loitered in a green churchyard and let his spirit like a demon mole work through the clay soil and gravel hard to see skull coffined bones and funeral stole, pitying each form that hungry death hath marred and filling it once more with human soul. So this question, which is very long, it's a rhetorical question, basically means who hasn't hung around a churchyard and thought about the dead bodies under the ground? <laughs> Um, so he's, he thinks that everyone's done this at some point, and maybe they ha did in the 19th century. They're quite obsessed with death. I've probably done this because I find churchyards interesting, but I don't think it's a normal thing to do, especially the idea that your spirit is like a demon mole going under the ground, trying to figure out where are people's skulls and coffin bones and so on. But the idea is who hasn't, sat and thought about the dead and felt bad for them and felt like they wished they were still alive. 
So there's this transitional state between life and death and how the living can still remember the dead and try and revive the dead in some way. So the, the theme of this is quite important, even though the quotes from it is not that useful for you. The idea of the transition between death and life and what the living can do to honor the dead is quite significant there. Um, so this is kind of how Isabella feels when she kneels by Lorenzo, she pities him she wants him to be filled once more with a human soul. And the only way she can really do that is to do his bidding. So she gazes into the fresh throne mold, the earth, as though she could reveal all the secrets there. And she saw her brothers, as uh, sorry, as her brothers would have seen, pale limbs at the bottle, bottom of a crystal well. And then on that murderous spot, she seemed to grow like a native lily of the dell. So she's been decaying, she's been dying and withering, and now she seemed to grow. So this is a good quote from this section. Like a native lily, like to a native lily of the dell. So she grows as if this environment suits her because she's near Lorenzo, even though he's dead. She's kind of revived and, and energized by finding his body, by realizing what happened to him. A lily is a flower that symbolizes death as well. Um, so it's kind of got a double meaning, that idea of her being a lily flower. And so she digs a lot more fervently with a lot more energy than misers, than money grabbing brothers can. So she, she's got, she's kind of spurred by passion and love, not by money. So Lorenzo's um, kind of revealed to Isabella what's happened. We've had the anagnorisis, the moment of realization, and now Isabella is digging. So the, the end of the story actually resolves quite quickly. So we're gonna kind of whiz through the next few stanzas. Um, but yeah, up to this point, there's quite a lot of depth and detail. And then beyond this, it's kind of a quick resolution. So well done for sticking with it so far. and. Hopefully you enjoy the kind of speedy ending in the next couple of uh, sections that we're going to look at.